Aaron Gunn, it's so great to have you join us. We really appreciate it. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Candace. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, you're surviving these very interesting times we're going through right now, I'm sure, with uh, lots of opinions and lots to say on it. So we're going to cover everything that's going on. But before we do, Aaron, I, I want uh, our audience to get to know you a little bit better. I've known you for several years now because we used to work together over at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, specifically working on the Generation Screwed campaign. But you uh, you grew up on Vancouver Island, correct? Yeah, I grew up on Vancouver Island, born and raised, raised in... Uh in the uh, left wing uh, sanctuary of Victoria and uh, still live there. Great. And so you, how, how did you, how did you find yourself sort of getting involved in politics and uh, you know, issues like standing up for the taxpayer? How, how does a, a young guy growing up in a left wing utopia like Victoria find himself sort of more on the right side of the uh, political spectrum? Well, that's a really good question. I don't know if there's a uh, kind of silver bullet uh, answer, but uh, I always had I grew up with a really strong family. It was also really close with my grandparents. So I always had a lot of respect for kind of tradition uh, and this country and uh, kind of, and there was always super interested in history and the history of this country and the world and the role that we've played. So I think that was kind of my entry point uh, into the conservative movement uh, at large. And then uh, from there, I actually met uh, Troy Lanigan, who you obviously uh, know, who, who at the time was the head of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. And I had already done some stuff with the uh, with electoral politics here locally. Uh, back then, actually, I grew up in a suburb of Victoria, and it was actually kind of all old Reform Party seats. Uh, Gary Lunn, if you remember, was actually uh, the MP where Elizabeth May is now. So um, it was a bit more of a mixed uh, political environment back back then in the in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, and uh, then I met Troy and uh, started doing some work with the with the Taxpayers Federation throughout university, and then joined them full time after I graduated. And it's pretty impressive what you were able to build with Generation Screwed. I mean, I worked on the campaign with you, and I wrote a book called Generation Screwed, all about the same issues. But you, you basically took what was a uh, you know, an intellectual idea like, hey, all these young people are really going to get a raw deal from just the system that is set up, given that people pay, you know, for the, the, the future. So, so you know, taxpayers today are borrowing uh, from future taxpayers to pay off today's debts, plus the fact that, you know, you have all these baby boomers retiring and we haven't done any, any pre-saving. So, so taking this, this concept and then turning it into an actual movement of young Canadians I mean, I think Generation Screwed is now on, what, 30 campuses across Canada with hundreds of members. So how, how, how was it that you sort of took what was a theoretical idea and turned it into a, a, a grassroots movement across the country? Well, I think the biggest thing is that there's simply all of these young people across the country who are smart, they're open to new ideas, and, and they get it really at, at, at a large, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, like they understand that, but they're just not being exposed to a lot of these ideas. Um, and just because all of our universities are so left leaning, uh, you know, from coast to coast. So what we were able to do is kind of present students with, a with an easy to understand kind of alternative to that. And, um, and I think there was an appetite for that just because, you know, people want to hear the other side of the story. And I think that's something you see what you guys are doing today at True North, where, you know, people are tired of the same, uh, kind of lazy and repetitive narratives coming out of mainstream media and they're they're interested and want to hear the other side of the story uh so that's i feel like what we were doing in part on university campuses is 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 delivering that side of the story that that they hadn't heard all they heard was you know all these government programs are necessary and they're and they're good and they're needed and uh without hearing you know the drawbacks of all the debt what we're leaving to the next generation the tax increases uh the unfunded social program so that's what we tried to do and uh, obviously struck a chord. Well, it's great. I, I know just like from my own personal experience in school, I was, by, by the time, especially by the time I was done university, I was pretty conservative or at least pretty libertarian. And I had a lot of friends that were like left-wing liberals who were very idealistic about the role of government as in like, there's nothing the government can't do. And, you know, why not just spend a little more to, to help pull everyone out of poverty? And then, you know, a couple of years after we graduate, I, I meet up with them and talk to them. And now that they're taxpayers, they have like a totally different perspective. They're like, man, I hate the government. It takes so much of my money. 
and it, it's kind of funny how that happens. So it's it's pretty, I think it's pretty impressive that you can find students that, that haven't had that experience yet of like, you know, the awakening that you get when you enter the real world and that would still be kind of, you know, interested in, in, in preserving the sort of fairness in society in terms of like how much you have to pay for programs that like other Canadians voted in and you didn't have a say. So, so that's pretty exciting. And so you, you went on from Generation Screwed. I know you're now the spokesperson for BC Proud and you were involved with Canada Proud, which is all, I guess, similar to the Ontario Proud um, movement uh, here in Ontario that really uh, helped uh, elect Doug Ford. So, so uh, what, what is it that you are up to now and what is it that BC Proud does? Yeah, so BC Proud. So, so I should clarify. In in January, I moved away officially from BC Proud now as well. So I got a bunch of uh, my own initiatives uh, on the go right now. A new show coming out called Politics Explained. But uh, being at BC Proud and, and Canada Proud was a really great experience. Um, they're a really cool group, as you obviously know. And uh, the amount of people they reach, millions of uh, of Canadians uh, each week. Um, and what I was able to do for them is basically make short 120 second videos normally that really tries to condense and uh, deliver a message on a particular issue that, that's in the news or sometimes that the news isn't covering or, and should be covering. Uh, so whether that's, uh, you know, the revolving door justice system, uh, the tearing down of, of statues across the country or tax hikes or the... Uh, I uh, did a lot of stuff on the illegal blockades that were happening ac across the country in the attempt to uh, stop the coastal gas link pipeline up in northern British Columbia. So uh, really whatever's being talked about, going out, making a video two to three minutes long that really tries to condense the argument and get the, the word out to Canadians that are oftentimes uh, that they're not hearing. Again, not hearing the other side of the story uh, or what's really happening. And I about the removal of the Sir John A. Macdonald statue over in Victoria, which was supposedly in an effort of reconciliation. Well, you know, no definition of the idea of reconciliation requires, you know, erasing history and reducing what by all accounts was a great man, a great leader who had this vision to create a country that is now one of the greatest countries in the world, reducing him to like a one dimensional character based on his views about Aboriginal Canadians, which were views that were widely held at the time. And you know, boiling him down to just that and pretending that that's the only aspect of him that matters. It, it's like everyone's lost their mind and, and you were sort of on the forefront of that battle saying, this is crazy, <laughs> this is madness. So why, why don't you tell us a little bit about that battle and what it was like sort of being on the front lines of watching them actively try to erase our history here in Canada? Yeah, well, uh I remember when it ha when I found out it was going to happen, and I can't stress enough how it came out of absolutely nowhere. Like it was, it was it wasn't like now where uh, this kind of thing was in the news like every day, and it seemed like every day it's another uh, statue being torn down or defaced. This came absolutely out of nowhere in Victoria, I believe. I think it was in August of 2018. And uh, I got a call from somebody, I guess, when it came out over the news, and they literally out of nowhere said, we're tearing down the statue. Uh, no real debate in the community or on the council at the time, and we're tearing it down in like three days. So I think this was on a Wednesday, and they were, they were tearing it down, I think, Saturday. They ended up tearing it down Saturday at like uh, four in the morning. So um, because they knew we were going to gather, we put out, or I set up just a Facebook event that said, you know, people come out and show your support for, for Johnny McDonald and and against them tearing down the statue. And more than 100 people showed up, uh, and this was in Victoria of all places, uh, early in the morning on Saturday. So, um, but of course they preempted us and, and brought the crew in at like three in the morning, four in the morning to start actually tearing it down. And it was a weird thing to watch, like the actual process of, you know, they had basically a, a rope around his uh, neck or a harness around his neck, and they had the, the saw or whatever they used to, cut the base of the statue uh, down and it was a really it was a really like surreal thing to see to just actually watch the uprooting and and tearing down of of our history and I mean there's so many contradictions uh, there's there's so little contact when talking about him I mean without Johnny McDonald the country doesn't even exist and uh, 
you know, we're here in Western Canada are probably living in the United States. And there probably are almost no Aboriginals because the Americans obviously uh, uh, were dealing with that issue in a in a much less uh, sympathetic way than than we did. So I just think like the lack of it's just it was it was really sad to see. And um, I think though it goes to the root of what these people on that radical left really believe, which they believe like the actual country of Canada is is it was a mistake that it shouldn't exist, that it has evil uh, origins to it. And um, that's something that, that I don't agree with. And I obviously the majority of Canadians don't agree with. So I think it's worth worth calling them out for and, and, and taking a stand on that. Well, absolutely. And you see it in every aspect. I, I feel like you were witnessing like the first iteration of it. And I've, I've noticed a shift just in the last few years with sort of extreme left-wing voices being amplified on social media. And you, you definitely hear this rhetoric that they accuse Sir John A. of genocide. And they, they don't even call us Canadians. They call us settlers, uh, which is supposed to be like a derogatory term. And they don't, I don't think they even call it Canada. Like they call it Turtle Island or they call it something else. And the, the idea, of course, is that it was like some kind of utopia or would be some kind of utopia if it weren't for Europeans coming to, to North America. But what I don't understand about the removal of the statue, was, it, was there a vote? Was it, was it democratically decided upon? Or did you know what the origins of that were? Because I feel like a lot of times these are just like, you know, a petition signed by 100 people brought to a council person and then you know, they just decide and, and it's, it's like there's no transparency or anything like that. Do you feel like this was a democratic decision in Victoria or how did this come about? Well, they have, there's a, there's a couple issues. So, so this, the decision to remove the statue came from something called the city family, which is this weird made up committee of, uh, I think the mayor's on it, like one or two counselors are on it. And then they have some Aboriginal representatives on it. But I, like, I, I don't know who, how they pick these individuals to be on it or whatever. And basically, it's a, it's a group of left-wing people that are using it as a way to justify decisions that they want to make and take. Um, now, after they announced it, that they were going to remove the statue, they did hold a vote on council. And I think that vote was something like six to one with an absta someone abstaining or, or something like that. But, it, but there was no consultation with the community. And the other thing you find in some of these kind of radical left-wing cities is uh, that statue belongs, when I say there was a vote in council, and I guess Toronto's not like this, but certain cities, Vancouver is also like this, and Victoria is the worst, where Victoria proper is a very small community. It's about, I think, 70,000 people of a larger uh, urban area of, of 350,000. So... You know, the downtown of that of our city and that statue uh, belongs to everyone. And the statue, because it's a piece of our history, you could argue belongs to all British Columbians and all Canadians. And yet you have a small group of individuals and in like this, the most left wing, uh, uh, you know, very geographically small area of the country have this kind of mock council vote without any consultation in the community and uh, tear down the statue three days later. So, um a statue of someone who died over 120 years ago. So I think it's uh, that's kind of the demographic democratic background to how it how it all went down. But um, so there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues there. There's no consultation stuff as well. But also the fact that these historical monuments aren't being protected by uh, the province or or the uh, the country the, the federal government uh, even as well. I think is an issue. And also just the fact on amalgamated cities, you can get, there's some benefits to them, but you, the, the downside is you get these really radical cores that usually pass all these ridiculous laws that, uh, that end up affecting everybody. Right. Because all the sort of more normal people live in the suburbs and exactly. they're the ones exactly. that have their own city councils and they have to deal with the, the madness of the, of the left-wing inner city university crowd. So what did they, it's kind of funny that you say there's no greater authority to program. It kind of reminds me of like the idea behind UNESCO, which is like World Heritage Sites. And the idea is that there are certain natural geographic sites and, and, and human history sites that are so important that you can't trust local governments 
to preserve. And so you had to have this international body and like the examples of how, why it was founded was like to protect the pyramids and, and, and things that kind of go greater than just like a national government. And it's almost like, man, we need, we need UNESCO to step in here to protect Canada's cultural history from the woke, the madness. So did they replace the John A. McDonald statue with something else or is it just a, a decapitated uh massive statue oh i think they have a little plaque there or something uh talking about how there was a johnny mcdonald statue there and the last that i've heard is that it's still in a warehouse somewhere i've had a couple city officials reach out to me uh with the whereabouts of it and i think they just keep kind of punting the decision down the road of what to do with this thing um i i i bet they're, they're gonna probably bury it somewhere in the back of a museum or or something like that and it's just so I mean, what, like, how do you form a consensus in society if we can't even agree that, like, the founder of the country, who was the first prime minister, one of the longest serving prime ministers, considered by uh, historians, who I think, you know, all the polls of historians, who I think also in general tend to lean to the left, one of the, if not the greatest, one of the three greatest prime ministers in Canada's history uh, across the board. And we can't even agree to have a have a statue of of him up. And the amount of amazing things that he did is is really a very for anyone who's listening who hasn't read like Johnny McDonald's uh, biography. Uh, there's a couple really good ones out there, and it's he's a really really incredible uh, incredible person. Basically, single handedly put this country together that you would at the time you had you know half of it was Catholic and French and and English and Protestant. Then you had a couple of provinces over here. The British Columbia was on the other side of a continent, almost nothing in between, uh, you know, a country to the South that was, that was 10 times bigger and, uh, you know, had a massive army at the time. The civil war was going on. It was amazing how they pieced the country together. So it just uh, makes that much more um, kind of depressing to watch what's, what's been happening. Even just the idea of Canada as a country, I mean, it, it seems like inevitable to us now, but obviously at the time, you know, like you mentioned, there's so many different uh, groups of people, ethnic kind of backgrounds, and, and it wasn't really an idea, a concept at the time that you would have a pluralistic society, a society made up of different ethnic groups and language groups, because at that point, you know, every, every nation was, every state was like a nation of people, a family, a tribe of people, and, and he had this vision, and and you're right, the Civil War was going on in the United States. He, he, he came to the table um, of Confederation with a copy of the Federalist Papers, which was the sort of brilliant papers crafted by the founders in their ongoing debates that they were having about how to build a, a perfect nation or, or build a nation based on ideals towards preserving individual liberty. And Sir John A. Macdonald took those basic ideas and said, you know, unfortunately, look at where America is going. They're, they're killing themselves and killing each other in, in droves. And we want to avoid that. So he took lessons from that. And and it really was a tremendous experiment in nation building and, and, and creating a country. And, you know, to your point that they remove the statue, nothing's there. And they put up a plaque. You know, th they could have still put up a plaque. They could have left the statue and said, you know, these are all the amazing things that Sir John A. Macdonald accomplished. You know, like men of his time, he held beliefs that today we find to be distasteful, or despicable, or liberal, and and include that, and then, and then and then maybe put up another statue of of an Aboriginal hero or Indigenous hero um, that, that 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 tells a different story. But the idea would be that you would contribute to public knowledge of history and and sort of common ideals of unity, as opposed to just tearing it down and and saying. We don't we don't believe in this anymore. Uh, how did the how did the local media cover this? Was it was this seen as like a, a huge controversy and an outrage or, or was media sort of complicit in in this era erasing of history? I would say the media, uh, the local media here was well, well, first of all, I'd say I think the media landscape has gotten a lot worse, even though this was only about two years ago. But uh, the, the media here did push back quite a bit. It was, there was a couple really good, uh, there's a local radio host, Adam Sterling, who was, who was all over them for it on the local radio. I mean, there's not that much local media here, in, in fairness. And, uh, but I mean, it was a huge story. Like, I mean, the, the letters to the editor and the, in the, the Times columnist, co uh, columnist here was, I mean, that's the name of the paper, the Times columnist. I mean, what else? It's just another good example. I mean, so, so, so there was a decent amount of pushback that almost everyone I talked to, uh, 
thought it was kind of outrageous and and ridiculous. But uh, again, a lot of the the rational, uh, what we might call normal people, are out in the suburbs or everywhere but living downtown. And um, so it was it, it was it was really sad to see it happen. But yeah, it was it was there wasn't a lot of groups that were other than the radical left that that were proponents of this. And like you said, with reconciliation, like there's there's no way you can make the argument that this somehow brought people together. Like it did not bring people together at all. And these continued actions are bringing people together. And uh, the, the point you make about like a plaque or or uh, putting up other statues that I think the point is, is that they're not actually interested in telling the full, full story. They're interested in erasing the past and painting a narrative that didn't exist. Like Johnny McDonald, uh, number one, like you said, the context of the time was a lot different than now. And, and people held views that uh, aren't acceptable today. But even at the time, Johnny McDonald, there's this incredible uh, exchange in the in the House of Commons where he's getting attacked for providing aid to uh, First Nations uh, on the prairies who were basically starving to death. And he was getting attacked for doing that by the, the opposition liberals at the time, uh, which goes to show you. And part of that was also just the fact that, that you know, this is before any government assistance programs even existed. There's, you know, there's no... There's no welfare uh, programs at this time or anything like that. So, and I mean, the average family in the 1800s is just trying to put food on the table and and basically make it through life without dying before they were 40. So I think like people just don't understand the context of of the time. But by all accounts, uh, Johnny McDonald was like a moderate uh, progressive figure from social uh, from a social perspective while he was prime minister, which to me makes it even more outrageous that they're attacking him. But I mean, just be like they're attacking Winston Churchill now, which I, I'm sure you saw in uh, the UK. And, uh, you know, they, they just they just defaced the Captain Vancouver statue in Vancouver. And he's considered to have like the best relations of almost any explorer with the indigenous communities. Uh, got on great with them while he was mapping the, you know, the coast, uh, the west coast of North America. And yet they're still attacking him just because, you know, he's a figure. He's a figure of history, he represents, uh, you know, you know, Great Britain or or Canada, and that's the real reason why they're going after him. It's not any of the loose connections to these aber. It's just the fact that John A. Macdonald is synonymous with Canada. He created the country, and they hate Canada, so they have to tear him down. So, it's it's um, it's it's just really it's really sad to see, and uh, I think a big problem is too is and I'm really worried for. The people under 30 now because there just seems to be a real lack of you know they don't know about anything about canadian history so all they hear if all they hear is you know johnny mcdonald was this really bad racist dude then, then that's what they think and then that's what they're going off of and they and they don't know anything else they don't know all the other great things that he did and uh, they're, they're not they don't understand how everything's being taken out of context well, yeah, you're right, because it's not like uh, Canadian schools are known as bastions of, you know, preserving history and, and tradition. I mean, who knows what students are being taught nowadays. And you're right, without that connection to our past, like, what is it that, that really holds us together? Well, I, I, I hope that there's a, a sort of stealth movement to liberate the Sir John A. statue from whatever warehouse they're uh, holding it in, and maybe some other community that has a a common sense uh, council or maybe some other province can can liberate that statue and, and resurrect it uh, somewhere where people will respect it. But so, so this was all happening almost two years ago, Aaron. And I feel like you did kind of get a sneak peek into the culture wars that have really just blown up and exploded. And you were definitely mentioning a bunch of examples, uh, you know, even even the statue of Queen Victoria in, in Leeds, uh, England, was completely uh, marked up in disgrace and she was called a racist but of course she was the queen when when slavery was abolished in the in the british empire she oversaw that and and that was after a hundred years of, of sort of activism on behalf of the british government to abolish it so it seems like the facts of the matter don't really it, it's irrelevant uh that's not the goal of, of these protesters so what, what what do you make of the latest rounds i think most people were in agreement i think almost everyone was in agreement that police brutality is awful that what happened to George Floyd was an absolute travesty and that the police officers involved should be charged, um, particularly the, the one police officer who had his knee on the man's neck. Uh, but they, the, the, the protests quickly morphed into something else and 
first they morphed into violence and riots, and now they've sort of morphed into this broader movement. And of course, it's inflicted us here in Canada, where you know we, we just have to, you know, admit that Canada is this horrible racist country, and if you don't, you could lose your job, and you could lose your livelihood, and you could get have your reputation destroyed. So. What, what, what do you make of the sort of latest iteration of these of the same sort of culture war? And, uh, you know, what, what what do you think we can do to combat it? Well, I think, uh, like you said, there's a small group of individuals who are use, who are almost taking advantage of the fact that, of course, everybody is against racism. Everybody is against police brutality. That's the weirdest thing about this whole whole movement is usually, when you have this social change or or political movement, uh, it's trying to achieve something. Or but everybody already agrees. Like ev- everybody's in agreement on these on these points. And uh, but what they're trying to use, like I, to me, it's it, they're trying to manufacture a big a big lie, um, and and turn Canada into like we're apartheid South Africa, and then use it as a way to justify uh, various programs or defunding the police. To kind of remake society in their in their you know uh, perceived uh, iteration of a true utopia. So um, yeah, I, I there's it's not even if you look at some of these groups, it's not even hidden that a lot of the people behind it are are Marxist or from Marxist backgrounds. And that's clearly where the push is coming from. And uh, to be honest, I'm sure you can uh, understand this as well. If we both have backgrounds in advocacy. But there are certain groups that are making millions and millions of dollars off of off of this uh, publicity and protests and stuff like that. They, they're using to funnel into their other uh, political objectives. So, I mean, that's obviously what's happening, and, and it's sad. But what what uh, and then as far as how to combat it, I think uh, the best thing to do is is people, whether it's someone like me with my videos over social media or it's at uh, you guys at, at True North is basically speaking the truth wherever possible. And the, the, the scariest thing for me is, is that I feel like, and I've had this conversation with multiple people lately, is that speaking the truth is becoming harder and more dangerous to do. Uh, you, you pointed out like you can get fired from your job. Um, you're not even speaking the truth. Just speaking with an open mind, even if you misspeak and apologize for it after, uh, you can be, you know, saw, saw what happened with Stockwell Day. So I think it's, um, yeah, I think I think that's the part that actually concerns me the most is is kind of the free speech dimension to it, and the mob mentality, and that we have to shut everybody down. You saw with with Rex Murphy in the National Post. Um, I'm sure you saw that. So I I think all these that's actually the most worrisome aspect of it uh to me and um the the inability of our society to 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 tolerate uh, opposing views when it comes to this this issue and although maybe i wouldn't actually say society because I, I feel like i've had this conversation with lots of people across the political spectrum and they're reasonable they get it they're okay with having the conversation but it's the media that just loses their mind and uh, like, if you have, if, if you're employed by one of these these mainstream groups, like you, what you know, for your own livelihood, you have to keep your mouth shut, or you're gonna be, you're gonna be canned sooner rather than later if you're not 100% all the time speaking verbatim from like the woke liberal handbook. So I think that's that's I think that's very concerning. Um, and uh, thank God for the internet because at least there's a way to nowadays to to go around them. Uh, well, absolutely. And uh, you, you're right that the media really amplifies it. Like I just notice sort of in my daily news scan or, you know, going on Apple News, they always uh, th- there are always stories highlighted of like the one or two stupid people that do something that like opposes the mainstream. Like, you know, here's this crazy guy that wore blackface to a Black Lives Matter protest. And like kind of as if that's like representative of of, of like what's happening out there in the country when it really is just like one really you know deranged example that's not accepted by by the mainstream but they they really want to highlight the like few sort of deranged people out there that are fighting against uh the mob you, you talked about rex murphy and i, I kind of want to just go into that in a little bit more detail because i find that what happened over at the national post to just be sort of astonishing uh, especially because national post of course is supposed to be the sort of conservative alternative newspaper um, to the other sort of establishment 
you know, Toronto Star, Globe and Mail. And the idea that Rex Murphy's column was somehow controversial, I mean, I've read it so many times now, sort of trying to understand what it was that really triggered this response from the sort of left wing, I guess, group of people that are actually working at Post Media, um, that working at, at the National Post that, that were, you know, so horrified by this column where it really just says, you know, Canada's a great country and we're not defined by racism. We should be careful of our rhetoric and be careful not to import rhetoric from the United States, just given that the countries are so different in their histories and their sort of political cultures. And, and somehow this was just like seen as a total outrage. You know, I think most Canadians, particularly most people watching this podcast, would fall into agreement with Rex Murphy and just be like, kind of, you know, this is obvious. But at the time, even we have a National Post, a conservative paper, pushing this idea that Canada is this sort of broken, racist society, that, that we have our own demons and that, you know, and, and even Rex said in his column, bigotry exists, racism exists in, in every country, and it exists in Canada. But 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 Rex's point was that Canada is not is not defined by this. It's not an overwhelming feature of, of our daily life in Canada. Um, so so you responded pretty strongly to this. You you sent out a tweet that said that it was outright embarrassing to watch the National Post cave to the far left mob. Consider canceling your subscription and supporting one of Canada's many other right of center news outlets. Well, the problem is that there aren't really any other right of center news outlets. I mean, Post Media owns the Sun newspapers, which are the sort of other sort of conservative populist newspaper. So as far as the mainstream media goes, I mean, where where, where can people turn or, or do they have to turn to the internet? And, and, and what, what do you just, what do you make of the culture that over there at the National Post that this all happened? I mean, well, as, as first of all, as far as the other outlets, I think I mean, everything's moving to the internet eventually, I think. I'm sure even the CBC gets a large portion of their traffic and viewership on online now. So I think, you know, obviously there's groups like True North and the Post Millennial and, and uh, others so, out there that are, that are working to fill that void. And I think that's what it is, a void. And uh, look, the National Post still has a lot of good columnists, obviously. Uh, but, it's, but as far as what happened at the National Post, I mean, it, it, it to be honest, completely blows my mind. I don't, I don't understand. I don't have a lot of background in like print, print media. I know you have a lot more experience th than I do there. So I'm not sure how you become the kind of right of center paper of, of record and then have a, have an, like that opinion that Rex Murphy, like I read it like many days before this all happened and when the outrage happened and like the partial retraction i had to go back and re reread it because i was like did i miss something when i read this and you gotta think that like 80 to 90 percent of conservatives would agree with what rex murphy was saying and i'm guaranteed a majority of the national post re readership so why are you hiring people that are not in alignment with your readership and the majority of people that should be interested in your paper and your audience. And that's something that, I mean, that's probably a much larger discussion. I don't, I don't know if it's the, 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 the journalism programs at universities or, or like, is it really this hard to have a newsroom hired full of of uh, not even cons conservatives and open-minded people. And look, you can, you can have, uh, I think National Post ran another op-ed from somebody else that was completely attacking everything Rex Murphy said. I think that's fine. That isn't that the point of having competing ideas and and uh, this kind of balance. So it just it just blows my mind that uh, it's like you have to ap apologize for having a conservative opinion. So it was like, oh, sorry, we accidentally ran a conservative op-ed in a in a uh, right of center newspaper. Our apologies. Like that's that's basically how I read the retraction, and it just is. It's just amazing to me. And one of the really disappointing things from my perspective about the Canadian media landscape, but that's uh, unfortunately, I think it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. So which is all the more reason to have groups like True North and Post Millennial and I'm doing my videos over over whatever network. Well, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, that they're, they're humiliated and embarrassed that, that that they're conservative and they're and they're having to, like, apologize for the fact that they're supposed to be conservative. And even the, uh, you know, rebuttal op-ed that they ran, I, I found that that op-ed was far worse than anything that Rex said in his column because the argument that the, the young woman writing it was, what she made, was basically that Rex has no business writing about this issue 
because he's a 73 year old white guy. So basically because of his identity and his skin color, he's not allowed to talk about an issue. And, and she even called in her piece um, saying that Rex should not have a national platform. So, so her, her rebuttal wasn't really about the merits of, of his piece, but more so just saying that he shouldn't have a platform because his opinion is, is, is counter to what, what she had to say. It's interesting because there was a big uh, sort of spat over at the New York Times uh, over something similar. There was a, an op-ed ran by, uh, run by a conservative senator, Tom Cotton, who basically said, you know, it's time to call in the National Guard to break up these riots. And a whole bunch of staffers at New York Times just sort of, you know, publish this letter, and, and they, they were all tweeting about how the, the, the op-ed apparently put black uh, lives at risk at the New York Times. And, and, and they had this whole kind of issue blow, blow up, but, you know, the New York Times is a, is a left-wing newspaper, and everyone knows that it's a liberal newspaper, so you kind of expect there to be a battle between the left and the far left happening at the New York Times. But, but, but why is there a battle happening between the left and the far left at the National Post, which is the conservative newspaper? It's... Um, Kind of sad, although I, I guess I wouldn't say the left and the far left. I would say centrists who pretend to be conservatives and the far left. That's sort of the uh, where the battle lines are drawn over there. Well, it, it's not just uh, Rex Murphy. You know, we've seen in, in, in you know over over the course of this whole uh, feud, uh, lots of people get canceled. Stockwell Day, um, Wendy Mesley, Jessica Mulroney. I, th- there's been so many people in Canada who have have sort of had their platforms taken away from them over really sort of obscure, I would say, things that have happened. I, I don't remember this stuff happening a couple of years ago, Aaron. Did, did, where, did, where did cancel culture come from and, and what can we do to combat it? I mean, it's, it's the number one thing probably that, that concerns me right now, right now about the future of our society broadly. But I mean, in, I think it's just like the this radical left, left I mean, they they, uh, they tried to do it to me actually on a recent video, but you can't really can't really cancel me. But the the I think what they do is they have this have this this small group group, uh, relatively small group of a country of 37 million that are hyper committed that are just like will do whatever the leader kind of tells them to do, and they just go after people or or they go at corporations and uh, the media. They basically have the media in their back pocket. And a lot of these corporations basically are just are making short term financial decisions when they're weighing getting rid of somebody or a bunch of negative publicity for a short period of time. Uh, there's no doubt to me that like like Talos could have rode, rode this out if they wanted to, like before they fired Stockwell Day um, and they would have been fine. It's not like there's going to be a bunch of customers and like it's not going to show up on their bottom line. So I think I think they're a bit of a paper tiger, but it's just their ability to. The ability of this like radical left mob, uh, because they they're very organized and they're very committed to control the media narrative at any point of time, to set up a protest outside of any company's headquarters at any time, anywhere, and get the media to cover it and call them racist or call them sexist or whatever, uh, that is giving them a great amount of influence. And I'm not really sure what the solution is, other than obviously broadening the media landscape as much as possible and honestly like certain uh, corporations are just really risk adverse and um they're bowing to the de- demands of these small radical minority which i think is really really bad for for um for uh canadian culture but i mean what, what's going on like the national post is really in some ways the most disappointing place because that should be a you know a place where conservatives and libertarians should be comfortable to speak their opinions about conservative and libertarian issues. That should not be a place uh, where they have to really be worried about the the backlash, uh, as it were. So, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm super concerned about it. So, sorry, you, you mentioned a minute ago that you were almost the subject of, of one of these cancel culture mobs. So I, I want to hear more about that. And I'll just add, that's a great thing about owning your own platform and, and, and not having to worry about, you know, getting fired or whatever, because you, on the Internet, you can anyone can have a, a YouTube page and, you know, you, you built up your following over a number of years. So it's it's not that easy. But still, the fact that they're trying uh, is, is, is really concerning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened? 
Well, in my case, it was uh, it was uh, interesting couple of days last week. So I did a video that was uh, unique. It was about a, a three minute long video, but similar to Rex Murphy's column, which basically said uh, racism exists in a, in Canada. Uh, it's terrible. It should be. Uh, it should be. Everything should be done to basically uh, to to drown it out and to uh, disown it. But that Canada is not a fundamentally racist country. The world, they're successful regardless of the origins uh, uh, where they come from, and uh, in particular, police aren't going around shooting people based on the color of their skin. And that that's kind of the high level summary. And I put that video out over uh, all my different channels. And uh, there wasn't, I mean, there's the normal, you know, you get the dialogue in the comment section, as I'm sure you're aware, but the 98% of my followers are on Facebook. So Facebook is a really big platform for me. Instagram is much smaller and has, you know, maybe a thousand of my personal friends and 1500 other followers. And what happens is I put it on there and for the first day or so it was, you know, you get a bunch of comments and likes and things like that. Uh, and then someone from Black Lives Matter, Victoria, stumbled across the video or something and then started posting all of these comments. Then they put it in their story and sent it to like the Black Lives. And of course, I can see all this because they're tagging my account in this and told everyone to go and comment and to report the account to Facebook and get this person canceled and send it to a bunch of the, the the Black Lives Matter people in Vancouver and Toronto. So all of a sudden I woke up one day and I had like 200 notifications or 200 comments on one Instagram video, which is not the main uh, platform. And, uh, you know, and they're even talking about, because I can watch their stories and they're telling people to go to my account, find out who follows me and then message people that follow me, telling them that I'm a racist and that you should be embarrassed and ashamed and uh, even, well, I shouldn't tell this one. Well, I'll say, you'll probably know who I'm talking about, but I can't say it explicitly. But there's even one instance of somebody emailing somebody who follows me, who I know, who I'm friends with, and emailing their work to tell them that so-and-so is associated with a white supremacist and that they should be fired. Not even for, not even for me, if somebody who's friends with me should be fired. And just spreading all this uh, defamatory uh, garbage, basically. Um, so I just, I mean, I, I just weathered it out, and it was, it's uh, life goes on. But it was, uh, it was an intro. It was clearly the reason I brought it up because it was a clearly a concerted effort. And if I had had, say, six months ago, I had got on a panel on the CBC or CTV or whatever, and I was doing something once a week, one hundred percent. Uh, everything else equal. These people would have targeted the media, and the media probably would have, uh, you know, gassed me uh, immediately. So, as much to their, uh, uh, they weren't happy about the fact that they weren't really able to do anything because I got my own own platform or working with like-minded groups. But it's uh, to me just like the the intensity of their um, resolve to destroy people's lives who disagree with them is is very scary and it, sh it should scare people uh i think because it's not it's not it's not in the spirit of of canada and kind of freedom of speech and freedom of expression and and all these kind of things